going in Jonah chapter 1. You know what? To get started, how about we just stand in honor of the reading of the Word of God if you're able. I'm going to actually read the first six verses and uh, we'll begin. The Bible says in Jonah chapter 1 verse 1, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out against it for their wickedness. I'm going to read that again. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. The introduction sermon that I gave on Jonah was only on that two verses. We see here that in this day and time of Jonah, the Ninevites, the the, the city of Nineveh, they're actually the Amorites, and these people were evil, they were wicked, they actually skinned people alive, they were brutal, they were murderous, they were violent, they were evil and wicked, and this was the people that Jonah was sent Jonah was sent to them. It says the word of God came to him. Arise, go, and cry out against this city's wickedness. Um, When I gave that introduction that Sunday, if you read in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus actually speaks of the Ninevites. Jesus said he's talking to these religious fakes. These religious fakes, by the way, the number one tool in the hand of Satan is a bunch of religious fakes. It was true 2,000 years ago, and it's true right now. A bunch of people that go to church every single week, that dress the part, that look right, but they rejected Jesus Christ to his face. They rejected him as Lord. It is possible to show up, get dressed up, have your Bible, get your family all looking clean, and to walk in here and to reject Jesus Christ as Lord. Many and most do, and the Bible teaches us so. One of the things that people say these days, well, I don't go to church because of these fake church people. I used to say that too, and I was headed to a devil's hell. We are still called to assemble. Jesus died. This is his bride. We are the body of Christ. You will not someday be able to stand before God and say, I didn't serve you and I didn't honor you because those religious fakes, friends, he's warned us about it. In, in Matthew 12, when Jesus brought up the story, he brought it up because they were seeking a sign. They'd seen the signs and the miracles of Jesus. They'd seen his power and they still rejected him to his face. He said, the men of Nineveh will rise up and condemn this generation. Why? You know what he meant? They saw Jesus. They saw his power. They saw his miracle and his healing. Jonah went as a short book. One of the greatest revivals in all of scripture. A city of a million people. And you know what the message was? It wasn't God loves you and forgives you. It wasn't, oh, God loves you. He wants to save you. You know what he said? Repent and cry out against their wickedness. The Bible says, Jesus said, the men of Nineveh will rise up and condemn that generation. They saw the power and the love and the forgiveness and they still didn't turn. That's good preaching right there. You're wondering if you're going to be able to sit down. You just give me a minute. (laughs) The Bible says in verse 3, But Jonah, but Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish, So he paid the fare and he went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He was supposed to go to Nineveh. On the map, if you look at it, Nineveh is that way, Tarshish is that way. He went the total opposite direction. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid and every man cried out to his God threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load, but Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship and laid down and was fast asleep. 
So the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. Father, in Jesus' name, let your anointing and your word go forth with your power, with your unction, with your presence. Don't let us simply go through fake religious motions. We didn't come here for a good, organized, three-point sermon. God, I'm not smart enough to do that anyways. We came here for your power and your Holy Ghost. People understand the things of the darkness. We talk about the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit in church. It goes in one in here and out the other, Father. I'm asking you, Father, that your ghost... Your Holy Spirit, the promise you sent when you arose from the dead, the promise that you sent to the church, you told them to go to Jerusalem and don't do nothing until they have received the power of the Holy Ghost. Lord, I'm asking your ghost and your presence to breathe in this place, my Father, my King, my Majesty. Oh, Lord, finish what you've begun. Move in this place, save souls. Give us hearts to repent, to revive. Give us hearts to be obedient and listen to your voice. I don't care how the service looks, God. We know these altars are open all the time. Minister and move in this place. Lord, I remember it's recorded in one of the Gospels. They saw Jesus do great things. They left and said, we've seen strange things today. Oh God, may we say we've seen some strange things today. Move. This is your place where your sheep or your people we're here for you. Have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I couldn't help but when I was studying and reading, I felt like God showed me the book of Jonah, four short chapters. We know, if you know the story, a million people get saved. I begin to see, and I felt like God began to show me something. This book is primarily, I couldn't help but think that Jonah was a picture of the church. I couldn't help but think that Jonah was a picture of the church no, this was a real story. It's not a picture or just a, a parable. This actually happened. Jonah was a prophet. He's mentioned in, in the book of 2 Kings. He's mentioned two other times in Scripture. Jesus mentioned him. And he's also in 2 Kings from the school of the prophets. But I couldn't help but think that this was a picture. You know, I thought, we, if you know this, this story... It's as if we see this great revival and God move. And I thought, you know, this, this story isn't so much of a picture of God pursuing the lost. It is that. I couldn't help but think that this was a picture of God pursuing Jonah. God pursuing his church. God pursuing the sleeper to wake up. So pick up with me in verse 3 again. So we know what he was told. The word of God came to Jonah. The word of God came and said, Arise and go and speak out and preach against their wickedness. It's come up before me. The verse 3, it says, But Jonah. But Jonah. You know, God told him, Arise and go preach this message. Look, look what it says in verse 3. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Did you notice when I read in those six verses, he went down to Joppa. He went down to go with him to Tarshish. He went down. We'll see here in a minute again. He went down into the boat. He went down. David, he was fleeing the presence of God. This is what happens when God tells us to do something. When we rebel against what He's telling us to do, we're trying to flee from the presence of the Lord. This is what rebellion does. This is what disobedience does. Now Jonah understood and knew God. Jonah knew, behold, where can I go from your presence? You know, one of the things about the devil and demons and darkness, they're in one place at one time. The devil and the demons and darkness are not omniscient. God is everywhere. 
If you're right here, he's here. He's out in your car right now. He's everywhere. God is everywhere at all times. But see, Jonah wanted to flee from the presence of the Lord. There is a difference between the omniscient presence of God and the manifest presence of God. When we're walking intimately with Him, when we're obeying Him, when we're doing what He's told us to do, it says, but Jonah rose to flee from the presence of the Lord. I couldn't help but wonder, how many of us are like Jonah? You know, it says here, it said that he fleed, he went down to Joppa and he paid the fare. He paid the fare. He went down, down, down. Listen, when you are in rebellion, when you are in disobedience of what God is telling you to do, you're fleeing the presence of God, you're going down. When we disobey God, there is always a price to pay. It said, so he paid the fare. Oh, you'll pay the fare. Oh, you'll pay the price. There is a price to pay when you disobey what God has clearly commanded us to do. It says, but the Lord sent out a great wind. I've seen people come in here so many times. I've seen the church so many times like Jonah. They're fleeing the presence of God. Then they want to send out a prayer request. Oh, this big storm has come. Oh, I've paid the fare. Somebody help me. And I'm looking at him and going, you are walking in darkness. You are disobeying God. That's what this, that's much of the church. That was me before I got saved. I know it's sin to do this. I do it anyways. I know it's sin to curse with my mouth. I do it anyways. I know it's sin to have sex outside of marriage. I do it anyways. I know it's sin to get drunk. I do it anyways. God's grace loves me and forgives me. That is a devilish lie that will take you to hell. People got these storms in their life. They're just like me before. You know, I used to come and cry at the altar. Oh, God, forgive me. I didn't want forgiveness. I didn't want Jesus Christ as Lord. I wanted God to make the storm go away. Oh, God, give me your presence again. Oh, God, make this storm go away. Hey, that storm's got your name all over it, Jonah. Because you're disobeying God. A storm came. Verse 5, the mariners, they were afraid. Every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down to the lower parts of the ship and laid down and was fast asleep. Some of us in here, sir, your family... Your family's experiencing the storm because of your rebellion and your disobedience, sir. Your family, some of us in here, we got people all around us crying out for help. These people needed help. They're throwing over the load of the ship. They're terrified. This is like most of the church, much of us. We're down into the ship and we're asleep. We're not awake. He says in Ephesians chapter 5. He says in Ephesians, Paul tells him, and have no, Ephesians 5.11, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore he says, listen to the church, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead. This is a warning from Paul to the church. Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead. And Christ will give you light. Christians, we're to awaken from our dead slumber. We're to awaken from being dead to the things of the Spirit. 
See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Paul tells us here to take advantage of the opportunities that we have. Everybody look at me. There's people all around us that need Jesus. That need to see the power, the unction, and the presence of God from you. You think I'm in ministry? My job is to equip the saints for ministry. You're in ministry. We make it so difficult and hard. I see people send videos and these things. How to give your faith. How to give discipleship. Let me tell you something. We've made it way too hard. Way too hard. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. When you're walking intimately with God, you'll be filled with the Spirit of God. Ask Him for His Spirit. He won't withhold it from you. The Bible says, don't be filled with this. See, when you're drunk, you act a certain way. When you get drunk, I've been up to them Chiefs games. They sing just a little bit louder. They dance just a little bit better. They get filled with them spirits. What's to say on the door? Let's say at the alcohol store. Wine and? Okay, you said it, not me. The Bible says don't be filled with this, but be filled with the Spirit of God. Some of you in here got filled just a little bit. You might be singing and dancing just a little bit better on a Sunday morning. He says, awake you who sleep. Second Corinthians chapter five. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Francis Chan recently had a statement. He said, if 2021, we have to tell Christians that they're supposed to act like Christ. He said, that's weird. That's weird. We got so many people, even people under the sound of my voice, you're not even saved and you're not born again. And you think you're right with God. Nothing old has passed away. Nothing's new in your life. That's scary. That was me. Many shall say in that day, Lord, Lord, didn't I do this and that? Jesus says, to tell them, depart from me. I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. The book of 1 John, you say that you walk with him and you walk in darkness, you read the book of 1 John. The Bible says you're a liar and you have, you have no place in him. Now all things are of God who has reconciled to us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us, somebody say us, has given us the ministry of reconciliation. What's that? That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. Somebody say we. Somebody say we. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. What does all this mean? See, we can have, you can have forgiveness just one way. Some of you have relationships in your life where maybe you've forgiven or they've forgiven you, but there's no reconciliation. Forgiveness only takes one party. Reconciliation takes two parties. See, why are we to give the message of reconciliation to this lost and dying world? Why are we, as these ambassadors, been given this? 
Because God has already forgiven every person under the sound of my voice. He's already paid the price. Did you know that if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Somebody say all. We're forgiven. The price has been paid. The blood of the Lamb who was slain. And they overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Jesus has overcome. Then why isn't everybody going to heaven? Because not everybody is reconciled and received the free pardon and gift of God's forgiveness. And our job as ambassadors, our job as ambassadors in this midst of this wicked and crooked, perverse generation, they're all around us. They're terrified. They're throwing the cargo over the corner of the ship. And we are ambassadors. I believe God is trying to tell the church, wake up somebody. Somebody, wake up. Arise from your sleep. Arise from your slumber. We have the message that we are as ambassadors as God. We're pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Listen, we make it too hard. I see these. People, we're making it too hard. He says somewhere in Corinthians, I'm afraid that you've been led astray by the simplicity of the gospel. You say, well, Branson, I don't have the personality you do. I'm, I, I'm not wild and run around and sweat, sweat and spit like a maniac. Well, that's fine. You be you. You be who God created you to be. Let me tell you something. There's people in your ship. There's people who are around you that I will never reach. And you are called to ministry. You are called by the Word of God. I read it to you. You are called to be His ambassador. People, we make it so difficult and so hard. I don't, we don't need videos and programs. We don't need more organization or higher IQ in the church. We don't need any more degrees. Let, let me tell you something. The church is at an all-time high in IQ in the pulpit of America. We got more diplomas and school and learning than the church has ever seen. We got the purest, best doctrine 24 hours a day everywhere. We got logos. We got uh, all this, uh, uh, all the Christian books and doctrine. We've got it all. Everybody does. Everywhere. Guess what? We've got less of the power of God than we've ever seen in this nation. We got less souls being saved places. We got less tears and brokenness. We got less men willing to hit these altars because you're too prideful. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, submit and pray, read stories throughout the whole Bible. The king, Solomon, all of them, Hezekiah, Josiah, we want their revivals without responding and doing nothing. We don't want to fast. We don't even know what it is to fast. We don't want to pray. We don't want to hit our faces. We're like Jonah, fast asleep in the bottom of a ship while our families are going down. Some of you men and women in here, your family's going down because of your decisions. You want to send me a prayer request? Pray for us, Branson. You pray for you. You hit the altar. You cry out to God. You get right with Him. People are overwhelmed in the church. 
overwhelmed with anxiety, overwhelmed with depression. All we hear about is the awareness of it. We need more awareness. We don't need any more sin awareness. We don't need any more of it. Anxiety is real. Yes, I know. Depression's real. Yes, yes, our nation's in a horrible place. There's wickedness and darkness. Yes, I know. Guess what? Jesus is still on the throne. Jesus still saves. And we can still arise and take this message as His ambassadors to a lost and dying world. Yes, we can preach the truth in love. Yes, we can stand against wickedness. We have to. Nobody else is. We have to. I've preached a sermon from this chapter several times over the years. It's from John chapter 1. John chapter 1 and verse 35. This is when Jesus meets the disciples for the first time. The Bible says again the next day, John, that's John the Baptist, stood with two of his disciples. And looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and seen, followed and said to them, What do you seek? That's a good question from Jesus right there. What do you seek? Some of you came here today. What are you, what are you seeking? Jesus asks you, some of you this morning, what are you seeking? Why are you here? What are you seeking? Some of you, you just want God to stop the storm. Some of you just wanted God to fix all your problems. I believe Jesus is asking some folks in here today, what do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say, when translated teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. And they came and saw where he was staying. Obviously, they wanted to follow Jesus. Obviously. One of them who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Verse 43, the following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael, said to him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathanael said to him, can anything good have come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, come and see. I'm not going to go into any more of that. Did you see how the disciples in the church was growing? Listen, they didn't go and say, let me give you a discipleship class on how to share your faith. They didn't say, look, let's go watch your video. Let's do this. Did you guys read what I, did you hear what I just said? And, and, and Philip found him and he found him. Andrew found Jesus and then he went and told Peter. And Peter went and followed Jesus. Everybody in here knows how to speak and how to talk. If you're not an ambassador doing your part, let's just quit lying and giving excuses. Let's just be honest. You don't care that people are going to hell. And you don't care about God's call on your life as an ambassador. You just don't care very much. You're selfish and you care about your money, your house, your job, your stuff, your life, and your things while people all around you are throwing cargo out the ship screaming, somebody give me the truth. The fact is, you just don't care. A British war general from the 19... From World War II, he said, we must teach our men to hate. For what they hate, they will fight. 
Winston Churchill said, we'll fight on the beaches, we'll fight on the streets, we'll fight in the neighborhoods, we will fight against that evil, socialist, wicked Nazi party. Watching that same dark, evil spirit come across America. I always wondered, how did they get all those people to go along with that evil socialist party? <laughs> We're watching it in America right now. That's good preaching right there. That British general said, we must teach them to hate. Nobody stands against sin anymore. Nobody. Nobody. We think, it's, we think it's mean to, to discipline our own kids. I've heard over the pulpit so many times over the years, well, I'm not going to tell you to discipline your kids. I'm not going to tell you what to do. Okay, yeah, my job's never to tell you my opinion. My job is always to preach to you the Bible. You know the Bible teaches you in Proverbs several times? Spank your kids! Woo! Maybe if we had more spankings, they wouldn't be tearing our cities apart. If they don't show respect at home, what makes you think they're going to go show respect to anybody else? We're all mean. We're all mean. Jesus was, Jesus was just love. Jesus was just love. Oh, Really? Yes, he is love. Yeah, God is love. By the way, the devil can give a little bit of scripture. All right. Jesus speaking, Luke chapter 12, verse 49. I came to send fire on the earth, and how I wish you were already kindled. But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am till it is accomplished. He's talking about the fervor of the spirit-filled witnesses that would arouse the antagonism of unbelievers. He's talking about people he can't wait till the spirit comes after his resurrection, the spirit of promise. Remember he told the church, he told them in Acts 1 or 2, you know what, they'd been with Jesus John for three and a half years and they weren't quite ready to start the church yet. They'd been with Jesus for three and a half years, but they weren't quite ready yet. Because after after he ascended to the Father at the right hand, he said, I'm going to send you the spirit of promise. I'm going to give it to you, and when you've received it, you'll receive power from on high. And until you receive that power, you ain't ready to do nothing yet. Jesus here looks forward to that. He looks forward and says, oh, how distressed that I am till it's accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on the earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. That's what Jesus said. From now on, five and one house will be divided. Three against two and two against three. Father will be divided against son, son against father. Mother against daughter and daughter against mother. Mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Huh. Huh. Don't hear about this Jesus anymore, do we? This is the Jesus of the Bible. The Bible says, be angry and sin not. Is there anybody angry at the wickedness that's enveloping Winfield, Kansas? The wickedness that's enveloping people in this church, this city, this state, this nation. We need some more Christians to be angry. John chapter 15. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. Branson, how can you grow a church this way? Are we, how, how did Jonah have the greatest revival in history? Go and preach against their wickedness. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant's not greater than his master. 
Verse 23, he who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. Verse 26, but when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. Chapter 16, these things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. I've told you these things so that when the world hates your guts, you won't stumble. You'll know the truth. Listen to this. Verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Really? For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. That's what Jesus said the Holy Spirit would do. Convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Do you know why the pulpits of America, do you know why you don't hear this message, the conviction of sin, righteousness, and judgment? Because they don't have the Holy Spirit. which is why our nation is in this mess. Our nation, the mess we're in, does not lie at the door of President Biden. And it does not lie at the door of the White House. It doesn't lie at the door of the Republicans, and it doesn't lie at the door of the Democrats. Boy, I'm about to be careful now. Oh, my. I'm about to be careful now. Recently had someone pull me aside. Something torqued him off that I said up here. I, I preached against abortion and said it was sin and evil and wickedness. Let me go on to say, it's demonic, it's satanic, and it's murder. And if you cast your vote to approve that, the blood of the innocent is on your hands. I am not sorry I said that. Preach it. That evil, dark, nasty wickedness. What is the Spirit going to do? He will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. By the way, all those words that I read to you were straight from Jesus. Listen, the point that Jesus is making, our goal is not to be hated by the world. Okay? Our goal is not to go around and to look for division. Our goal is not to go around and hope that people hate us. If you're one of those Christians and that's your type of attitude, that's wrong. I've seen people, Christians, run with that the wrong way and think, well, everybody hates me because God said they would right here. And they have no one following them. There's no love. There's no life in their ministry. You need to understand this. And I know I've been preaching hard this morning, but listen. The goal is not for people to hate us. The goal is not to try and give division. That's not the goal. And if that's what you took from me and from Jesus' words, you didn't catch what he was saying. What he was saying is this. Listen, the gospel message, if you don't want to offend somebody, then being a Christian is not for you. If you don't want to offend anyone, go sell ice cream. Listen, what he's saying is this. When we stand in truth and love, you guys realize that Jesus was completely sinless and perfect, right? You realize that they hated him so much that they murdered and crucified him. You see, when perfect love, when we stand for the truth, 
when we stand for what's right. When we say killing innocent babies is sin and wrong, people will hate you. When you tell people that they need to get right with God and we give the gospel message in truth and in love, Jesus was saying, they hated me. What do you think they're going to do to you? They're going to hate you all the more. I'm not sinless. I'm not the spotless lamb of God. I'm trying to do my best to serve God with all my heart, my life, with all that I've got. But this may, I don't do it perfectly. And I have to remember in these dark, wicked days, listen, everybody look this way. People are not the enemy. People are not the enemy. There is an unseen satanic structure. Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And then he goes on to talk about taking up the whole armor of God. See, this is where Jonah had gotten it wrong, guys. Jonah began to see these evil, wicked Ninevites as the enemy. Everybody look right this way. People are not the enemy. There's an unseen satanic structure. Who do you think is pushing this evilness? Who do you think is pushing this darkness? And listen, guess what? I got saved October 21st, 2007. And you know what? Before then, I was lost and deceived in the darkness. And you know what? I was part of the problem. And I was ruled as like a puppet and a puppet master. I was ruled by my flesh. I was ruled by wickedness. I carried out wickedness and darkness. Drugs and fighting. Evilness. Messing up my life and other people's lives. See, this is the gospel message. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's equality. That's everybody. For God so loved the world. That's equality. That's all of us. That he gave his only begotten son. That's Jesus. That whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. People are not the enemy. God so loved the world that he gave his son Jesus that whoever believes in him and places their faith in Jesus Christ and repents and turns from their sin, they shall not perish but have everlasting life. This message will step on the toes of the world because you're telling them that you're not right with God. Because you're telling them, yes, the message of the gospel if you don't get right with God, hell is a real place. No one talks about hell anymore. Hell's a real place. I don't want anybody to go there. I don't want anybody. There may be in a crowd this size. I don't know how many is here this morning. I'm guessing 100, uh, 120. I have no idea. If you're not saved, what if God comes back tonight? What if you die in a car wreck? What if this is the last sermon I ever preach? I want you to know something. God brought you here today to hear this preacher say this. He loves you and he wants to save you. And if you don't repent and get right with God and call upon the name of the Lord, you're going to die and go to hell for an eternity. And God loves you and does not want that. He gave his son so you don't have to go there. But he will not force you. Back to our text in Jonah. Matt, come on, brother. Matthew 
Verse 6, the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know whose cause this troubles come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Please tell us for whose cause this troubles come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What's your country? What people are you from? So he said to them, I'm a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, why have you done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they cried out to the Lord. You notice here, Jonah still won't pray. Look at this season that Jonah's in right now. He's fled the presence of God. He's gone down, down, down. They're begging him all around, please wake up. Please call on your God. And then these lost sailors, they cry out to God. They became afraid. Who are you? Where are you from? He says, I'm a Hebrew. I serve the Lord of heaven and earth who made the sea and the dry land. And they were like, holy smokes. Faith began to arise in these sailors. Then they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, Lord, do not let us perish for this man's life. Do not charge us with innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. I put a note in my Bible. Jonah still doesn't repent and cry out to God. Still not praying. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. These sailors on the boat got saved. They didn't have faith in the right God before. They did now. They got saved. You notice that they offered a sacrifice and took vows? You know, John, when we have an altar... The altar call is a picture. In the Old Testament, they would come and they would lay at the altar their sacrifice. It was right when you walked into the outer temple. Right when you walked into the temple, the sacrifice, whether it was the, the, the bull, the goat, the sheep, they would sacrifice that and it was in front of everybody. It wasn't hidden and it wasn't a secret. We know, according to the New Testament, we know that the blood of bulls and goats could never pay for sin. We know that all those were a picture looking forward to our Lamb of God, Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, the Chosen One, the Anointed One, our Christ, our sacrificial Lamb. Jesus paid it all. That's why we can be reconciled to Him, because of the blood of Jesus Christ. So now that we no longer do that, we have the blood of Jesus. But see, in the New Testament, even, and I could show you places in Scripture, see, we have these altars here. It's just a picture. It's a picture of laying down my rights, my pride. Then the mirrored feared the Lord and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. They didn't sit back and say, well... I can just do it right here in my heart. No, they got up and they did something about it. Everybody look this way. There is a proper response to the presence of God. Call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Some of you in here this morning, you need rest. Some of you in here need to get saved and born again. Some of you in here, you are saved and you do love God and you need some rest. You know what Jesus says? Come. Come to me. Come. That's what Jesus says. There is an invitation and I invite you this morning. Come. 
The sea ceased from the raging. The men feared the Lord exceedingly, offered a sacrifice to the Lord, and took vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. We'll pick up on chapter 2 next week. I highlighted something here. Verse 4 earlier, the Lord sent out a great wind. The wind obeyed. The sea ceased from its raging. The Lord prepared a fish. The wind obeyed. The sea obeyed. The sailors obeyed. The fish obeyed. And Jonah, Jonah still won't obey. We'll continue in our story with Jonah. There's something that we can learn, though. And I want to say this about old Jonah. Don't judge Jonah by this bad season that he had in his life. Please. Please don't judge Jonah by this bad season that he had. I'm right behind you, Katie. I'm sorry. Please don't judge Jonah by this bad season that he had. We'll continue the story in the next couple weeks. Can I tell you guys something? I've had a Jonah season. I've had a Jonah season before. So have you probably. We see throughout the story I couldn't help. I I felt like God showed that to me, John. This is a picture of God pursuing Jonah. I wonder how many of us are being pursued by God today. Aren't you thankful? Oh, man. I'm thankful. I believe it's Psalm 16. My heart instructs me in the night seasons. You know, sometimes we go through these seasons of life. We're just... We're like Jonah here. We've got a bad attitude. We've become selfish. We're not serving God the way we ought to. The sea obeyed. Fish obeyed. The wind obeyed. And not yet Jonah. Can I tell you guys something? I'm so thankful that God didn't give up on me in my Jonah season. I'm so thankful. It took me going through a Jonah season for God to show me some things that I didn't know and see about Branson. You know, we've been meeting on Sunday mornings here for literally for four months. Four months. Did you guys know that? We started in my house in October, five weeks there. Fifteen weeks we rented on Sunday and Wednesday night. No Sunday morning. God provided us this building. We've been meeting here. Our first Sunday morning was Easter. If you look at the calendar, we've literally been meeting on Sunday mornings here for four months. God has done great things. And let me tell you something. There's a lot of organization. There's a lot of things that are coming yet. I've had people ask about a membership role. We will have a membership role. I'm going to shoot for that for January of 2022. I'm going to shoot for that for this coming year. Right now, we're keeping things overly simple. That's what we're doing right now. I've had a lot of questions. What about this? What about that? Everybody look right here. Hang tight. We'll get there. We've been meeting on Sunday mornings for four months. I'm still looking. I'm still seeing people who are leading. I'm still looking for people who are leaders. I'm still looking. You know what we need to be able to do well? We need to be able to do well with what we've got first before we really grow. I don't have it. Listen, I'm not complaining. I I promise. I love you and I thank all of you. We just had the best VBS I've ever seen in my life. We had kids and adults saved. Adults who are here now, they got saved during VBS. Listen, we're going to keep things overly simple for now. I was looking at this road out front, it's under construction. I feel like God's showing me. We're under construction right now. You know, there are the construction signs out there. You gotta slow down. There's all the cones. You gotta slow down to 20. 
That's where we're at right now. We gotta slow down, and our church is under construction right now. We'll have a lot, we'll have other things that are coming, but you know, let me tell you what we need to be able to do well first. We need to be able to do well first with what we've got. I'm not complaining, but I'm gonna tell you guys this. We don't have enough people on our security team. We don't have enough of our children's church rotation. We don't have enough of our nursery rotation. We need to be able to handle and do well with what we've got. I think the last three or four weeks we run between, uh, between 100 and 140 people. There's a lot of people gone this morning. Lots of people who are gone this morning. But listen, summer's going to get over. Everybody's going to, everyone's going to come back. We're going to be running 140, 150 on Sunday mornings all the time. We need to be able to do with what we've got really well. That's where we're at right now. God's doing great things. I can tell you this, the best is yet to come. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to continue praying. We're going to continue meeting. We're going to be here on Sunday mornings. We're going to be here. If you don't know, we have service on Wednesday night from 7 to 8.15. Can I tell you something that's given me uh, some victory in my life in almost 14 years of serving God? Everybody look this way. A bunch of life-changing services equals life change. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, but all the more as you see the day approaching. America has less church than we've ever had. Most of you don't come on Wednesday night. We used to have my old church back then when we had Sunday night. We had Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. You couldn't be a part of leadership or anything if you didn't come to two of the main services a week. I get people asking me, when are we going to do this men's group? When are we do more women's group? When are we going to do this? How about you try showing up on Wednesday night first? How about you show up to what we've got before we add some more services? I'm not trying to be mean, but listen. Listen. Be faithful to the house of God. Be faithful to the house of God. And listen, with everything going on, I know COVID's serious. Listen, I didn't get tested. I called when I was sick and I asked them, what can you do for me? Nothing, come get tested. Well, what for? You can't do nothing for me? Yeah, just come get tested. Listen, the last thing I need, friend, somebody tell me I'm sick. My goodness. Hey, listen, COVID is serious, but don't you dare tolerate, let your brain fall out your head, okay? Listen, if you're sick, then stay home. Don't call and tell me this week, hey, uh, I, was, uh, I was contacted with somebody who had COVID. Are you going to tell the whole church? No, I'm not. <laughs> don't tell me, listen, don't tell me that you're afraid to go to church, but you're going up to Brahms, Walmart, in the bank. Let me tell you something. If you're going those other places, newsflash, you've been exposed. I'm not trying to take it light. I am not. I'm not taking it light. I've never been so sick in my life. I prayed, God, don't let me die and don't let me go to the hospital. That's what I prayed. Just because it's serious, it doesn't make it serious enough for me to throw away my God-given brain. I didn't plan on going there. Being faithful to the house of God is a very serious thing. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, but all the more, all the more as you see the day approaching. We need more people to be faithful to the house of God. I call it the house of God because the Bible calls it the house of God. The church is the assembly. Revelation, very end. The spirit and the bride say come. The bride is the church, the body of Christ. And yes, I understand the body is us. And it's not these buildings. It's not these walls. I also understand, according to the Bible, it is us assembling on the first day of the week. And you read in Acts, they went to church a whole lot more than we do. And it tells us, don't forsake the assembling all the more as you see the day approaching. That was written 2,000 years ago. 
Friend, I, I believe the day is approaching, I do. I don't know if God's gonna come back in five minutes or 500 years. I know this though, I know this. <laughs> we need each other. The future of Faith Ignited Church is together. The future of Faith Ignited Church is assembled. The future of Faith Ignited Church is more prayer meetings, is more fasting, it's more brokenness, it's more tears. It's more of John Cross laying on the floor. It's more, give me some men and women. Give me some people up in this place that want to serve Him. Give me some people that want to show up and serve and do something in the house of God. If you've been here for a few, if you've been here and you like our church, if you're not doing something here, why not? you to understand something about me it might give you better understanding and I believe it's scripture and biblical you realize this isn't just a club and a place you realize that he is my God my king and my master he comes before work he comes before my wife he comes before school job he comes before my children God comes before everything because he is God He's my king. Father, we love you. Finish what you started all over this place. Everyone stop.